Hello and welcome to Caucasian Journal video interviews. Our guests today are from eGovernance Academy in Estonia. Christina Mend, Senior Fellow in eDemocracy, and uh, Christina Reinsalo, Program Director at the same academy. We decided we must meet with your organization when we learned about your mission, which is uh, assist in making digital transformations happen. Estonian e-governance academy was founded 2002 already, so we are quite old <laughs> organization if you can say so. Our mission is actually on everyday basis, we consult and train uh, local government, central government, civil society organizations on how to use technology for, for secure, for for inclusive society and, and we really help and assist uh, organizations to, to, to understand and fully implement the potential of technology in order to, to improve the interaction with citizens but also to provide new, new level of services. We have been active in, in many parts of the world. Uh, can we perhaps name one of the brightest uh, case studies yeah, in terms of scale and scope, of course, I can name, well, starting from Ukraine, we are currently running big infrastructure project there. It is called uh, Trebita in Estonia, the same system, similar system is called XRoon, which enables uh, different data sets and, and public organizations to, to share their data and, and, and provide services. So then I would say, Another place which is far away, it's, uh, such as Benin. These are kind of new democracies and developing countries, but we are also consulting many kind of old democracies and, 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 and small countries. Faroe Islands is also one place which were eager to, to kind of to, to implement similar uh, infrastructure to, to our C6 roads uh, type of things. We had a huge project in Moldova where we provided Moldovan civil society organizations who are active in advocacy, anti-corruption uh, activities. We provided some crowdsourcing platform, uh, online platform where citizens can report anonymously on, on corruption, concrete cases, and then the civil society organizations being active in this area, say, really use this input to, to, to investigate further and also, uh, also take actions to, in order to, to address those issues. To mention as a last thing, we were also uh, kind of pioneers in Estonia and now we have replicated this practice everywhere is participatory budgeting, which enables, which is the main concept is that citizens should be and can be taking part in making decisions on local budgets, budgets of the municipalities. It is very popular now in Estonia, in our neighboring countries, but we have replicated this even in, even in Georgia. So uh, some cities, Kutaisi and Arkatsike, they were our pilot cities a few years ago, where we, we, we tested and experimented with this practice. That's really very impressive. Um, May I ask you a more general question? What actually happened in Estonia that led to achieving such a leading position in this field, in the digital field? Well, there are two main reasons that, um, that we usually tell the story through. Is one is that at the beginning of 90s, when Estonia was, um, became independent, small, in a very poor country, uh, the Soviet infrastructure didn't support anymore, but we had to create our own country, our own systems. And we had people who had been already trained, for example, in Finland, who already had information about technology, being able to help governance, being able to help democracy, being able to help cheaply and efficiently um, the country to develop its services. And that poverty led to finding innovative solutions and then finding um, and having people who were ready to jump in and ready to contribute and closeness to Finland helps. And over the next years and, and um, and periods, we have always also had presidents who are very supportive of the IT development. The president at that time, and also the the, the presidents, the two presidents before the current one. The the fourth component that I would say is that Estonians trust their leaders and trust 
the, the government systems, even in those very, very hard times. So innovative digital solutions didn't make people fear of things, but they were ready to test. The first thing that really um, sort of addressed people's needs and was very attractive to try because it was very beneficial was e-taxation. So if, I, if, I, if you do taxation through digital means, you get your income tax back much quicker than those people who do it by paper. Of course you would do it digitally. Whenever we, we, we really assist governments that really you have to give kind of carrot or candy to those pe people, really, you, you have to show them the clear benefit because, I mean, other than that, I mean, people do not understand what is a clear or concrete benefit for them using, starting to use technologies. I don't know, very characteristic to Estonians, at least at that time, and I hope we still have this, is really this very high ambition. And really, as, as Christina mentioned, we have really very good, uh, good neighbors who were doing so well, like Sweden and Finland, and with Finland we are culturally and, and, and very close. We wanted to have the same level of life as quickly as possible. And it was understood that for that, we have to do something differently. We have to do something completely differently, because other than that, we are not catching them up. So it was, and innovation usually happens really when you are, you, 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 there is lack of resources. Actually, it amazes me still that there was high level of consensus in society that let's invest, we are a poor country, we cannot rise the salary or something, but let's now invest all together in technologies. Our banks, when they started, they started using digital tools very, very quickly and they learned from Swedish and, and Finnish banks, businesses and civil society organizations, the same thing. They were relatively poor, there weren't a lot of money, but then you invest in, uh, you invest in the solutions that actually are helping you to bring this kind of long, long lasting change, but, but you'd have to do it uh, more and more um, efficiently and working together. And one more maybe thing, which is I think that the first uh, nationwide uh, projects were really, I mean, it was very good start, starting from educating from these digital literacy schools. One of the biggest projects was Tiger Leap, which was all about computerizing schools, giving free access to students, to teachers, and start, you know, uh, educate uh, and, and uh, educate digitally and literate teachers and, and, and kids. And this is, I mean, I think it was one one of the crucial, most crucial steps, because what I see in many governments and, and countries happening is that, I mean, government launches with sometimes with donor money, fancy e-services. But if people are illiterate, if they do not have access or access is, is, or is too expensive or, or tools. tools, I mean, nobody is going to use them. But in Estonia, it really started from the right, right, right thing, right angles. That's, that's really important because um, in our Caucasian journal, we are mostly interested in uh, the Western experience in terms of using it in our countries. So uh, why we are especially interested in the Estonian experience? Because it has this started starting point which is similar to our uh, region's uh, countries, but the result is completely different. And maybe one, one thing that I'd also like to stress, it's, it's related to the project that we are currently involved in, in in Georgia and in Ukraine, is also that we are a small country, right? We are 1.3, 1.4 million. We don't have many natural resources. We are not a rich nation, right? We speak a language which is spoken by less than a million people in the world. So our richness, our resource has to come from somewhere else. So it comes from the people. And the only way you can capitalize on that if you are actually creating a very engaging society. So yes, we are small as a country, but we can be big as a nation. So with digital tools, you could do it even better. Right? And maybe you're not thinking that you're actively participating in policy making, but the way we are using some services, the way you are expressing your opinion, you are launching petitions, you are signing petitions, that's also a sign, or that is a very strong sign, of active citizenship. Uh, let's move to your current project. It's a project called DRIVE, um, Digital Research and Impact 
for Vulnerable E-Citizens Project. We're very proud of that name. When the public sector, both local and national, are developing new policies, they are not always considering people and their needs. Yes, it's easy to develop, but then you suddenly have 30% of your population who either because they have no access or because they have no tools or because it's a bad quality or because they, are, they don't trust it or because they are unaware of it or because they don't have skills to do it, they can't benefit from that service. So without noticing, they become digitally vulnerable groups. With our Georgian partner, Institute for the Development of Freedom and Information and our Ukrainian partner, 2030 Tech for Public Good, we, um, we designed this project where we focus on how to avoid digitally vulnerable groups, how to avoid creating digital divide further. After the fact-finding mission that we are doing now, we put together um, a report with recommendations, which are for civil society organizations, public sector, our partners and all that. We put it together and then jointly decide which of those ideas we could work on. And then again, with the same recommendations, we're going to work with local civil society organizations and public sector and design um, capacity building events, we can call them trainings, but the basic logic is to remind people and make them aware and understand of the concept of digital vulnerability and make sure that in the future they are aware of that and they think about it. But what happens if in, in the course of your fact-finding mission uh, you uh, see that uh, the scope of needed work is so huge that you cannot fund it yourself, you cannot handle it. So it's, it's just beyond uh, the capability of a uh, non-profit organization or academy. Um, that's why we're also meeting here already now with public, uh, public service, uh, with public officials. We also have to look at sort of the theory of change and decide, okay, this is the bigger picture, but this is what we can do in this particular area. So we're not claiming to solve every problem in, in Georgia or Ukraine, but this will be our avenue that we can can take with the resources we have, with the knowledge we have. But we work with the others to make sure that they are aware. And just to mention that we also, of course, introduce our policy recommendations and, and proposals to all different donors. Estonian government is also, I mean, Georgia is always one of the priority countries for Estonian government in terms of uh, cooperation aid money. So we introduce our donors also. These are the results of our, our mapping. These are our recommendations. So please take something with those recommendations. You can use this. This project is, is also interesting this way that it has a very interesting funder called Luminate. It's the, the, the folks from who created eBay. It's their private foundation. And it's also good to see that there are funders who are sort of leaving free hands for the for the for organization like us and the local organizations to design the projects the way we believe is necessary. Do you think that uh, problems such as digital divide are already solved in your country or not? Not at all, not at all. Well, I would say that in Estonia we are not experiencing this kind of, I would say, classical or traditional digital divide. Now I would say age gap or um, region gap or regional or, or gender gap in terms of you know access or skills or whatever digital issues. But I would say the gap, of course, exists and it is more probably in in skills and and motivations. And many people are still very very vulnerable in Estonia in terms of in in this context as well because they just really I say they do not still have skills enough or say are just not motivated to push other or to give more effort in order to find trustful sources. So these are issues I think we should still pay pretty much focus and attention. What about democracy? Uh, E-democracy e and uh, classic democracy. 
Do you think the advancement of uh, digital government and other tools in Estonia led to improvement of general democracy? Well, this is the place where we actually sing in choir and say that there is no e-democracy without democracy. democracy. <laughs> That's very clear, right? That's one of the things we always begin by saying that that doesn't, that doesn't exist. But indeed, that is one of the key things when we meet with our partners from other countries and the e-democracy question always comes up. And quite often they expect us or we are expected to provide miraculous tools like okay if we have a fabulous Facebook system or we have a fabulous platform then mystically everything turns into e-democracy and, the, and they are very surprised when we actually start with a very basic of democratic values democratic tools if there is no if 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 citizen engagement, trusting citizen contribution to the society is not in the blood system of that country or of that society, the tools, the digital tools can even damage it, can even make it worse or become very elitist in certain areas. Citizen contribution or participation should lead to something, should have concrete outcome because, I mean, you can still, as government institution or, I don't know, local institution, you can engage citizens one time, but if this is negative experience or if the outcome is, is not considered or is, is going to the black box, I mean, next time nobody will come. I mean, nobody will trust you anymore. Well, um, I have a feeling that we have only touched the, uh, some of the most important things, only pinpointed the, uh, the important questions. Uh, let's decide that uh, we have started this conversation, which absolutely must be uh, developed further. If there is anything that you would like to add? Maybe the one thing that we were just discussing with Kristina um, before we came here is that one thing that we always need to keep in mind is that it's not only the change of the leaders that brings about the change in the society, but we as citizens have to change as well. So we decided 25 years ago to start using digital solutions. We decided that um, our tax declarations will be done online. We decided that we are okay with the fact that our data can be used and analyzed this or that way. We decided that um, you know we want to audit civil society organizations not because it's a control mechanism but because it's a, it's a sort of code of ethic type of thing. Um, so we decided that we're not going to pay bribes to the police and we're not going to take bribes. A lot of it has to do with a not with the fact of the changes of the government or the presidents or the leaders, but it actually starts with ourselves and that is the main thing. We, we see it happening everywhere. So that, I mean, it's very easy to find excuses yeah. that, well, we have this kind of government, we have so, we can't do anything, so yeah. stupid yeah. civil servants. Well, you still can do as citizen, as individual, you can still do some small steps really. And, and what maybe I would say also, which is also important, in terms of, you know, taking in those foreign uh, consultants and, and donors, it's always very important also not to pretend to be something better than you are. Just show, I mean, tell them honestly what problems you, you have in your society. I mean, as government representative, tell you that you have these problems. And so, I mean, this honest picture helps you much more than, you know, to pretend to show something differently. It's, it's like patients and doctors relation, you know, you get better treatment when you are honest and you tell all. But all you also things. have to follow the doctor's orders. Of course. It? The job that Christina and I are doing and our colleagues are doing, we're not going to give any miraculous medicine or solutions or say now do this and everything will become different. We are more process consultants. We help our partners to go through the process because at the end of the day these will be Georgian solutions for Georgian people and it will be a Georgian vision of their society. We can help to facilitate the process but we are not going to say do this because that worked in Estonia and I think a very blind copying of systems is anyway very very dangerous. And you have to talk about your failures it's not about I mean we don't have only success stories in Estonia I mean we we should be also very honest and and, and, and tell all our our mm. lessons learned and 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 failures as well very quite honestly. So we are equally excited to see what our report tells us because we also have no idea. We'll see. <laughs> well, thank you and uh, good luck with the drive and all your other projects. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. Pleasure. Thank to you be for here. inviting thank us. Thank you.
We cover what matters. Caucasian Journal.